Hello and welcome back to Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. So, we need to go back to Dresden this episode as we've got some things to do there. But before we do that, I think what we should do is we should get our party absolutely tired out of their mind exploring as much of this area as possible just so that we have the map explored. Because realistically, at some point we're going to want most of the map explored so we can get to places as quickly as possible. So, that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm also just checking. Do you have any movement? No. Perfect. Right. So, first things first, we're going to move this lot kind of, uh, well, down this way. We'll see what's down here. And once they get tired, we'll send them back to Dresden and then we'll rest. That's the plan anyway. I'm assuming this is just leading directly to the fort. But we'll see. Yes, it just leads directly to the fort. Cool. So there's no side paths, no nothing. So we know there's no reason to come down here unless we're going directly for that fort. Alright, let's head back. We might get fatigued again, but it doesn't really matter. Oh, I just realized, because we've gone over a, a day... Oh, even better, it's also our recruitment day. I was going to say we can move this squad again, but because it's also our recruitment day, we can um, move that around. I'm also just checking. Do we have another army trying to get somewhere? No. Okay. Uh, let's do some recruitment. Uh, let's start with this one. If we got anybody who can join this army. Uh, we don't. Also, what are church guards? They just appeared here and we can't actually ever recruit them. Hmm. We must need to build a building if we want to recruit them. Interesting. Uh, we didn't get any mercenaries that we want, so I'm going to just re-roll them immediately. Um, oh, we want these guys. Perfect. Mongrel sharpshooters we definitely want. Cool. Uh, so that was a good re-roll. Uh, let's go into this army here, and we can start recruiting into this one for just now. So, we want all of these guys. Uh, we want all of you. And then we want all of you, if possible. Uh, let's see if we can find a squad that's actually got space for you. This one's got space. Okay. And we should be able to recruit almost all of them. we got two left to recruit. Okay, cool. So, all of our recruiting is effectively done for the week, minus uh, 500 finance points, which we will get, well, we'll get it tomorrow. We're making a ton of finance points. I didn't realize we're making 1,700 now. It's almost 2,000 a, uh, a day. That's double what we had uh, not that long ago. Ooh, we got Fire Elemental uh, Creation, which will come back when we finish healing the giants. Perfect. Uh, so, we can do that one again. Okay, cool. Uh, now what we want to do is we want to move our armies, so we're going to move Boring Squad along here, and basically just see if there's anything else going on. Wow, that's a long path. So does this lead to the fort? This must lead to the fort. There's no other path that could take you, right? Where does this lead? Like, where does this one go? Because it's definitely not leading to this path. Oh, right, it goes around here? That's weird. So that's an 8th strength army. Do we think we could take on that army? Uh, I don't know. I've never seen the 39. What are you? Uh, maybe I have seen you. So you've got a melee bite attack? Okay. What about fallen knights? I definitely haven't seen them. Lots of hit points. Fairly, ta uh, fairly high damage. Okay. Hmm. I think we try it. I think we try it. This is a powerful squad, so it's not necessarily a bad idea. Oh, I see. We can't cross over the river. Well, that'll be the end of that then. Okay, so does this path, it must go directly to the demon army, right? Maybe that's where we end this one before we teleport back. We are about to become fatigued. Uh, I think I'm going to risk it and go just along here. Just so I can test whether going down um, leads directly to the fort. It does. Okay, cool. So we know both of these routes take us to the fort. Don't need to worry about them anymore. There must be a way to make a bridge here. Like, this this is just asking for a bridge at some point. Anyway. New crusade thing. Strengthen diplomatic connections. Definitely want to do that. We'll do that in a day. And look at that. We now have a day left on these two. And we've explored the map. So, we can now uh, go back, rest, and then hopefully, um, yeah, do a bunch of crusade management now. Just see if we've got anything else going on. We don't, doesn't look like it. Also, uh, we haven't got any uh, demons being spawned to attack us right now, which is very nice. I wonder whether there, it gives you, like, moments of peace, like, deliberately, or whether, like, there's a set mount that it will give you in an act or something. I don't know. Anyway, 
right now we seem to be uh, dealing with it no problem. I'm also worried that at some point it's going to be like, all right, now here's a strength 10 army, deal with it. And then we're going to be in big trouble, but hey, hopefully not. Uh, even if that is the case, what we'll probably do is we'll probably send in our general fireball it to death and then um, send in my, our other army afterwards. Oh, hello. Um, This was unexpected. Hold up, commander. The thing is, remember how that crusader went missing a while back and then he was found outside the city walls, disemboweled? And Nevia pauses and gives you a search in look. Uh, what are you talking about? A couple of weeks back, a crusader went missing, a young guy. He opened an investigation in the citadel, even, but it was a bust. His body turned up a few days later. That's all that came of the inquiry. I never gave up on the investigation, even when everybody else stopped, uh, stopped digging. I know we're at war, and that people are left dying left and right. There's no reason to turn a blind eye to crime. So that's it, Commander. Another crusader has just gone missing. He left the barracks to come here. He would have gone past the gates. My gut tells me that the killer won't uh, keep him alive for long. So, Commander, you need to start searching the area right now. Try and figure out where he's been taken. Um, This is all quite unexpected. Would definitely be where I'm going with this one. Uh, death uh, often shows up where you least expect it. It's not like I picked the timing. Um, tell me about the missing crusader. Uh, he's the youngest son of a uh, poor nobleman from Mendev. He's called something like Relic or Relac. He's young, barely out of the nursery. He decided he was a man now and off to where he went. You know how it goes. Hmm. The, ma the guy probably just went out to get some fresh air. He'll stroll back in at any moment. What's the point in raising an alarm? Listen, Commander, do you trust me or not? If you do, then just do as I say. Find the kid and then we'll talk. Do you know who the murderer is? I don't have a clue. And Evie's answer comes too quickly, her gaze dropping before she can force herself to meet your eye. Oh no, what are you not telling me? I'm telling you the truth and nothing but the truth. I have my own theory, sure, but nothing concrete. So it's best I keep my mouth shut on that front. Oh no. Oh no. You see, I don't remember this guy, and maybe it's just my memory failing me, but maybe this guy was meant to be related to a companion quest? Potentially a companion quest with somebody who might, you know, be a little bit evil. I'm wondering whether this is a Wendowog, whether we were meant to raise an investigation, then the Wendowog uh, line continued and she's the one killing people. That's what I have in my head right now, and that's why Nevia won't tell us. Or, I'm trying to think of other potential people it could be. I mean, obviously, it could be Erebeth, if you were going for somebody who she wants to protect, but that doesn't seem likely. Um, Kalesa could be one. Yeah, or, yeah, the Drow. Okay, let's, let's think of other things. What makes you think you can issue orders to the Knight Commander? No, I'm just going to say, alright, I'll search for the Crusader. Uh, get going then. He passed the gates and took a right. Ask around. Check out the buildings. I'll be waiting for you here. Passed the gates and took a right. Is in companion quests. Oh no. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> How much trouble is hu a human life worth? How many lives can be sacrificed for the greater good? These questions may not have troubled the commander before, but now it looks like she'll be forced to reckon with them. Oh no, oh no. I think I might be right. Also, I'm fatigued. Um, wait, where was it? Uh, he passed the gates and took a right. So he's along here, probably in that building. We are a bit fatigued right now, so if we have to fight, this is very bad. But, you know. I mean, he's, like, realistically, it's probably the abandoned building, right? Hello? Anybody home? Hmm. A man's clothes are heaped on the floor. They were taken off Let in a hurry. Off. That's not a good sign, I would guess. Hmm. Definitely not a good sign. You can hear muffled sighs coming from the other room. Um... Camellia? Camellia? Hello? 
how lovely to see you here. Hearing steps behind her, Camellia whips around and freezes. She glances at the bloody dagger in her hand and then at the dead body at her feet. How, ha how lovely to see you here. Her lips quiver for a fraction of a second before settling into an unimpeachable polite smile. What's going on here? Socorus is an ancient land. The spirits of these places have spoken to people since time immemorial, and some of those people heard them and were able to respond. The shamans of Socorus were always held in high esteem. They knew the will of the spirits, the will of the land itself. Many Kelids would come to the shamans to learn what the spirits desired in order to gain their support. Camellia pauses, lost in memories that cannot be her own. I'll wait for her to continue. When the world wound opened and the demons poured into Galarian, they drowned Socorus in blood. The earth moaned as it soaked up the blood of Kelids, Crusaders, and demons. The spirits drank this blood, slowly becoming deranged and turning into incarnations of madness and pain. Look what Sarkoris has turned into! It's an open wound on the body of Galarian. The world wound has changed it beyond all recognition. And the spirits, these poor creatures have been corrupted. Twisted by war, they moan and they howl, but only shamans can hear their senseless cries of agony. I am a shaman. Morea, the spirit I am bonded with, is mad and can speak of nothing but her endless hunger for blood. I give her what she asks for. I feed her the blood of crusaders. Oh. Just that simple, huh? Well, okay, you just continue. I'll leave you be. Um, Maria, do we got anything else? Oh, right, there you go. Maria is the name of the spirit that lives in Camellia's amulet. Camellia believes that this is the spirit of the land of Socorus. The spirit is insane but may hold the key to healing the land. Okay. Um, carry on. The spirits of Socorus can no longer speak to shamans. All I can hear is the cacophony of their howls, screams, and laments. But there is a way to restore their sanity. By performing rituals. Bloody but effective rituals. When the untainted blood of the Crusaders cleanses the corruption that Maria fed on for centuries, the spirit will regain her sanity and I shall be able to speak to her. I shall be able to ask her advice, to find out how we can heal the world wound. Tell me, isn't this knowledge worth a handful of lives? Okay, so I'm going to do the perception check first, about the first or second victim. Um... We know that she probably killed the person underground when we first met her, and the other one was the Gargoyles camp, I believe. So, or like, yeah, when the Gargoyles attacked our camp. This isn't your first or even your second victim, is it? How many have you killed? Too few. Maria's hunger is still so great. Her pain cannot be soothed by a single victim. But success is within my grasp. I can feel it. It is even possible that today's victim will be the last. Who is she, this Maria of yours? Forgive me, I forgot to make the introductions. This is Maria. Or rather, this is her home. Or her prison, to call a spade a spade. I caught this spirit a long time ago, and I tried for so long to speak with it. My little demented ball of rage. I felt compelled to bind it to this amulet, just temporarily, until I worked out how to help it. Uh-huh. If I am to be fully honest, her name, Maria, is of my own devising. She is not yet able to speak to me, but I still needed a name to call her by. To me, it sounds like Camellia is absolutely crazy. So she's trapped this spirit in an amulet. And she thinks that by feeding it blood, um, it will then be able to talk to her. However, it's not yet talked to her, and she has no proof of this. It's just a theory. So, um, up until now, what she's done is she's put a thing that you cannot see into an amulet, and then she's killed a bunch of people. Okay, fair enough. Um, why do you think your method will work? I do not think. 
I know. Oh. I sense things many people cannot. I can infer what the spirits want. For example, there is one spirit hanging over your left shoulder as we speak. It came to enjoy Morea's victim. Can you sense its hunger? <laughs> well, it's good to know that she's not just making it up. She just senses that it will do something. I mean, sure, okay, that makes sense now. Spirits are akin to animals. You cannot bring a hungry dog to heal. You cannot stroke a hungry cat. To speak to a spirit, you must first feed it. It is not their fault that after so many years of torment, the only thing that can satisfy their hunger is blood. My ritual will work. I did not read about it in books or learn it from some wizened teacher. You could say that I invented it myself, with Morea's help. I just know that it will work sooner or later. I can feel it. What exactly are you hoping to learn from this Maria of yours? The world wound cannot be allowed to poison all the lands of Galarian. The spirits of Socorus know this better even than you and I. They may know how to heal it. And if not, then perhaps they will know how to eradicate it quickly and painlessly. We're fighting against demons. It is a just cause. But imagine we win and the demons vanish for good. Do you think the world wound will vanish along with them? That it's something we can defeat with weapons? That it won't burst open again at some point in the future like an old festering abscess? I am thinking of the future of these lands. Of how to heal them and restore them. Would you not agree that a few crusaders' lives is a price worth paying? Who was this young man, your victim? He's the youngest son of a noble from Mendiv. I believe his name was... Rillic? Or Relic? I think the Dolt was in love with me. He was ever so eager to come with me to this house. One hint was all it took. He is of no interest to me. Morea wanted his blood, so I sacrificed him. The rest is immaterial. Alright, uh, I don't believe in this nonsense. That is your right. Just as a mole has the right not to believe in the existence of the sun, a butterfly has the right not to believe in summer, an infant has the right not to believe in death, I have revealed the truth to you. You are free to reject it if you wish. Okay. Well, if you weren't a companion, you would probably be being stamped right now. So, all right, what are you proposing? My ritual is not yet complete. I have made the sacrifice. Now I just have to let Maria drink the blood. Will... Will you allow me to complete the ritual? Um, I feel like I should say no. But I kind of want to say yes. Um... I did quick say before coming in here. I'm gonna set some very simple parameters, okay? If Camellia ends up leaving, I am going to reload and let her complete the ritual. But until that point, I'm going to act as if we can stop her completing the ritual. So, swear that you will stop the killings and I will spare you this time. What a pain. But if these are your terms, then I agree. Okay, it all worked out. Um, obviously if she wasn't a companion, she'd be getting stab stabbed, but, well, maybe. But, but at this point, we're fine. <laughs> you know, when I saw you standing there, I thought my life would end tonight, but you spared me. Thank you. I would like to speak with you a little later. Please come and see me. No need to be shy, for I have no more secrets to keep from you. Now, we should leave this place. You go first. I will follow in a few minutes. Um... No? How about you leave first and don't complete your ritual when I turn my back? You know, I think that would probably be quite good. Um... She's like, comp she's totally gonna just do the ritual when I leave. How stupid does she think I am? Well, anyway, time to leave. And I'm back in there. 
What are you doing? Still here, huh? Oh, never mind. <laughs> well, time to leave. Now, how are we going to explain this to Anevia? Um, I'm thinking lie. I'm thinking lie is probably the best approach here. Anevia stretches lazily and yawns, but her eyes are fixed on you. Well, Commander, have you solved the problem? First, tell me honestly, what exactly do you know about this crime? Crime? What crime? Anevia says with a smirk before becoming deadly serious. Listen, Commander, I was just using my brain, following certain individuals, listening to what people were saying on the street. I had my suspicions, but what are suspicions worth? On their own, nothing. I didn't have any proof. I'm not Erebeth. I'm not going to go digging for the truth, because if I dug enough, the Night Commander would be down a companion, smack bang in the middle of a war. How would that help anything? I'm not going to be the one to scupper this crusade, so I'll be keeping my mouth shut. Fair enough. Apparently we're kindred spirits, Anevia. Anevia speaks slowly, staring into your eyes. I trust that you'll handle this in whatever way is best for the crusade. If you want to tell Erebeth everything, go ahead. It's your call. The problem has been solved. That's all I needed to know. Thanks, Commander. That is one large crusader. <laughs> I just noticed it there. Um... Okay. Interesting. So, we've accepted Camellia's ritual. I mean, to be fair, it would be pretty hypocritical at this point to uh, get rid of Camellia, given that we have Wendowog there. <laughs> we just saw people just eating people for fun. Um, Let's move. So, yeah. Um, I think we need to go speak to Camellia as a matter of urgency and figure out, you know, what's going on. She said she had no secrets anymore, so... I mean, let's go see what she has to say. Hey, Camellia. Camellia greets you with a broad smile and licks her lips rap uh, rapaciously. Demons dance in her eyes. Hello, my friend. You don't mind if I call you that, do you? Oh, no. She thinks we're a kindred spirit. We let her get away with whatever she was doing, and now she's like, Ah, now we're best of pals. You're in my inner circle. I've done a lot of thinking since we last met. You have every reason to hand me over to the headsman, and yet something stayed your hand. Whatever guides you, your promise to keep my secret makes us accomplices of sorts, even friends. Shared secrets bring people closer, don't you think, my friend? She pierces you with her stare as if she's trying to see inside your head. Okay. Um... Sometimes I find severed bags in my head. Is that your handiwork? No, that is the handiwork of Darren, but I want to just see what her, her response is. What good are they to me? Camellia's voice is bored and indifferent. The moment life leaves the body, now that is exciting. In the moments that follow, when the body is cooling down rapidly, losing the last of its warmth, I'm filled with sweet languor. But the cold corpse that remains is just a corpse. It holds no interest to me. Tell me about yourself. With pleasure! Friends share everything! What do you want to know? How many people have killed? Which organ is the most delicious? I'll tell you everything. Oh wow. Okay. She, she was serious. She's like, I have no secrets. I'm going to tell you absolutely everything. Tell me about your life in Horgus's mansion. I have no complaints. I had everything I could dream of. Well, except freedom, which I had no need of anyway. I value security and comfort much more than the opportunity to get in trouble firsthand. I had the best fencing teachers. My mentor was a shaman from Veresia. He wore I wore beautiful dresses and ate sumptuous meals. A rich library kept me from getting too bored. A personal garden for my walks. I even had a puppy. A little barking ball of happiness. What happened to the puppy, Camellia? Okay, nothing. We're fine. Some might disapprove of my father locking me up in a mansion until I matured and gained control over my powers. He changed the servants as soon as they suspected, started suspecting anything. He even had steel bars installed on the windows. I can see it was because he cared. He was protecting me from the dangers of the world, and he was protecting the world for me. Camellia is the name of a flower, right? Yes, it's the only thing I have left of my dearly departed half-elf mother. Father told me that she liked working in the garden so much that she even gave her child the name of a flower. She shrugs vaguely. And there is something else I inherited from my mother. 
her beauty. The young woman offers the barest hint of a smile. You know what I like most about those who inherit the features of different races like my mother and I? We gain the, bo the best of both worlds. By the way, before you start to pity me, I should say that I don't have the slightest affection for my mother, may her soul burn in the abyss. My father took uh, good enough care of me for the both of them. Are you bothered by the fact that Horgus never openly embraced you as his daughter? Why would that bother me? He took care of me and indulged my every whim. To thank him, I only had to lead the life of a lead a secluded life and keep my mouth shut. I understand his reluctance to claim a child born of a servant girl as his daughter. There's nothing wrong with looking after one's social status. Besides, you understand, Mendevian society would hardly have accepted me considering my peculiarities. Um, tell me about your connection to the spirits. I can barely remember the first time. I was just a girl back then. I only remembered someone's voice in my head demanding something. I didn't even understand what it was. I was out in the garden playing with my precious puppy. Oh no. I don't know how it happened, but when it was over, the puppy's head was in my hands and his body was lying at my feet. I had a very bad feeling the moment that she said she had a puppy. It, it, it was leading towards this exact moment. Like, it's the, everything was happy and shiny and bright and I'm like, well, something's going to go bad and that puppy is the thing. I can remember seeing my father's healers and clerics for a few days and even the exorcist he brought to our house. None of them were able to drive the haunting voices from my head. They continued until the old Varician woman came to live with us. To explain that I was fine, I was just highly sensitive to the pain of the land that we lived in. The voices in my head were not symptoms of insanity, but desperate prayers for help. My father paid her an unspeakable sum, and she remained at our house teaching me to talk to the spirits. Uh-huh. She was a vicious crone and a nasty piece of work. She would hit me with a whip just for looking at her. She would yell at me when I failed to communicate with the spirit I summoned. When father left for a few weeks on some errand, she locked me in the basement at night. I, Now I see that I terrified the old woman. Well, it was her fault. She should have taken the money and run while she had the chance. I was so happy when the spirits asked for her blood. Camellia licks her parched lips. Looking into her lifeless eyes, I felt such bliss as I'd never known in my, all my life. Um, okay, um, why did you kill her? Surely your father would have thrown her out if you told her what, sh if you told him what she was doing. Camellia shrugs. Perhaps. Anyway, I don't remember him being very upset when he discovered her corpse in the basement after returning home from his trip. Um, okay, well, this, your spirit is fascinating. I've never seen anything like it. She rests the snake-shaped uh, bone amulet in her palm. You like it, beautiful, isn't it? But it's more than just an ornate trinket. It's home to one of the spirits. This spirit was so weak when I found her. She was hardly anything but a small shred of rage and madness. I locked her in my amulet and I've taken care of her ever since. I try to talk to her. I don't know her name, so I call her Maria. Uh, Maria. Her spirit has been growing stronger and she just asks for more and more blood. I feel like every ritual bloodletting makes her madness subside. Just a few more and I'll be able to talk to her and find out how to heal the lands of ancient Sarkoris. Okay. Um, tell me about the ritual killings you performed. I killed to learn this, the will of the spirits of the land. Sarkoris was torn apart by demons and the blood of many thousands of living creatures poisoned these lands for many years. The world wound keeps growing bigger and bigger. It's no surprise that the spirits of this place have gone mad and endlessly thirst for more and more blood. Only when bathed in blood can they regain their senses, at least temporarily. But it would be a lie to say I don't enjoy what I do. She licks her lips hungrily. I remember all of them, every last breath, shriek and sob, every fatal stab, blood running down the blade as I pull it from a victim's heart, the taste of the drops on my tongue. I like to watch the blood pool beneath the body as it cools. By the way, did you know that blood only flows while the heart is still pumping? That was quite a discovery for me. I opened one of my victims and watched her heart slow, beat, 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 and then silence. Camellia's breath grows fast and heavy and leaves her chest with a forceful rush. 
her pupils are dilated, and he seems to look through you or inside you, swallowing. Camellia brushes away a strand of hair dark as night. My connections to the my connection to the spirits of old Sarkoris is overwhelming. Hmm. Your whole face transforms when you talk about murder. I've always dreamed of discussing it with someone other than my father. How fortunate that we're friends now. Oh no. I feel like I've made a mistake, but you know, we're we're in this deep now. Um tell me what will happen if the spirits ask for my blood? I wonder. She sizes you up pensively. There's only one way to find out. Seeing the suspicion on your face, Camellia lets out a short laugh. Ha ha, I jest, of course. I promise if something like that starts to happen, I'll tell you at once. I'm loyal to you. You can trust me. We're friends. Yeah, you're not the first companion to say that, and you're not the first companion I don't trust saying that. Um, What do you think of the powers you've received from me? What do I think of them? I love them. I've always felt special, and my ability to talk to spirits was proof of that. But now... Now I feel that I can do anything. Tear someone in half. Demon or human. Freeze a beating heart in someone's chest with a simple look or a mere thought. With a wish I can make the blood of a living being flow in the wrong direction. Camellia laughs throatily. It is celestial bliss, my friend. I'm grateful that, uh, for you giving it to me. I've learned enough. Have I mentioned that I love our conversations? Tell me about yourself. I just wanted to get that off like that not to be uh, highlighted anymore. Are you still trying to learn something from the spirit in your amulet? Maria, the spirit that's locked my amulet, is only slowly awakening. I need to give her blood to lift the shroud of madness so I can talk to her. Camellia's eyes grow cloudy. Sir Chorus is in pain, I can feel it. As you commanded, I have not fed her spirit. That is why, alas, I've been, I, I haven't been able to lift Maria's uh, madness or li heal the land's suffering. I have to go. Visit me again soon. You don't want me to start missing you. Alright. Well, welcome to the crazy squad, uh, Camellia. Now I'm looking at my party and I'm Follow going, me. well, that's one less person who was sort of sane. She just mm -hmm. likes blood. You know what? I kind of get the feeling that she would get along very well with Wenduok. Also, do the rest of my companions know about her murdering? That would be an odd thing if they did, to be honest. Oh, um, hey, Ember. I'm going to talk to you in a second. I have somebody else's, um, somebody else I need to speak to. Hey, Horgus. Um, why did you not tell me Camellia was a blood-sucking murderer? Um, let's talk about Camellia and her peculiarities. I, I take it you know about that now, too. <sighs> Horgus sighs heavily. Well, what's the point in discussing it? Go and speak to her. I don't know much about it. A Varesian shaman I hired to help Camellia said that she communicates with spirits. Here's vo her voices or something. Uh, too bad the old woman couldn't help. The voices whispered something to my daughter and she sacrificed the Varesian to them. Uh, right here. Right there in the mansion cellar. Orgus wipes the sweat from his forehead. What was I supposed to do? I couldn't throw Camellia out in the street. I couldn't turn over to the guards. I'm her father, you know. Perhaps help was what she needed. But I didn't wish to make those incidents public. The Gworm's honest name mustn't be sullied by scandal. That's why I locked Camellia in the mansion, so she would remain out of the public eye. Who knows when a spirit might whisper something to her. I changed the servants every few months so they wouldn't discover anything they shouldn't. Sometimes thieves snuck into the mansion, or my guards would catch some bandits attacking my retinue while traveling. The roads in Mendev are not very safe. I turned such people over to Camellia to pacify her spirits. I'm telling you this now and it terrifies me, but I didn't have a choice. Camellia says that she's about to get through to the spirits of Sarkoris and learn how to heal the land. Well, maybe it's nonsense, but what if it isn't? What if it's important? Do I have the right to halt such a crucial endeavor? Horgus stops and casts a suspicious glance at you. Don't forget, I'm only telling you this because you found out our secret. If there's a trial or a scandal, I'll deny everything. I will not let anyone disgrace the honoured name of the Gworms. Okay, tell me about the battle for Dresden, because apparently that's something I haven't asked you about. Um, oh right, we could, because he's, okay, this is the, this is the past changing thing. Apparently he's somebody who's had their past changed. 
Regrettably, I cannot tell you much about that. You were in the vanguard, so you, you might have a clearer picture of those events. Still, the news of Dresden was no longer under the th uh, the news that Dresden was no longer under threat took a hefty load off my mind. The constant skirmishes around Dresden had long ago become routine for our generation. Everyone knew that Dresden was to fall someday, regardless of the Holy Banner's presence. But then you came out of nowhere, clearing all the demons from the city's outskirts in a single battle. Unbelievable. I am not one for optimism, but I must admit that even I had a spark of some adolescent enthusiasm. What if we are really going to make it this time? The only person I'd like to warn you about is uh, Warden Staunton. He is used to having a firm grip on Dresden. So why would he hand the city over to some upstart commander and leave without a word? Sounds suspicious if you ask me. Oh, okay. Um, and he left, so that proves that he's not around right now, Onwards. which was something that we were wondering about. We couldn't find him, but that didn't necessarily mean he wasn't around. It just meant that, you know, we couldn't at that moment find where he was on the map. Anyway, hello, Ember. I forgot that we needed to find out about you. Ember is bobbing her head and humming a tune. She greets you with a careful, uh, a carefree, cheerful smile. Her wandering eyes linger on you for just a moment before darting off again into the distance. How are the former Baphomet cultists doing? You know, this cult did very bad things to them. They made them hurt and frighten other, uh, other and frighten each other and themselves, and then lied that they didn't have a way back. They convinced them that the only choice was for a sinner to sin again. But they are much better now. But still, their souls, inside they are, like my hands, all burnt. Besides, simple city dwellers who weren't in the cult don't understand them at all. They say things to them. Maybe it's even fair, but it just makes everything worse. Some people don't want to believe they repented, as if they want them to go back to the demons. But I feel sorry for them. They ask questions and listen. Those conversations make them feel better, and others might listen and not fall for the same thing. You see how good it is that you didn't kill them. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, I don't think it's a great idea, but, well, whatever you want, uh, Ember. Whatever you want. Oh, also, uh, now we have Ember here, just to prove something I thought earlier. Where are we? Um, blackened. There you go. So when they were describing themselves as having blackened hearts, it fits with her curse. That's cool. Oh, and now, actually, we have two um, things to read. The Wayward. The people laughed at the barefoot little beggar who preached to them about goodness and love in her gentle voice. In her gentle voice, the cultists should have laughed themselves silly when they heard her offering up prayers to save the demon lords. But when she was tossed onto the profane altar of Baphomet, the little preacher's tears spilled onto the stone, and the cultists dropped to their knees to repent their evil deeds. Power lies with this unassuming girl, and when it makes itself fully known, it will be no laughing matter. Oh, okay. And we have Camellia. More than one dark tale lurked behind the Grand Dwelling's handsome facade. After lifting the veil on her secrets, Camellia found a friend in one in the commander, someone she can lean on as she works to help all of Zarkoris. The end justifies the means, after all, especially if one has noble intentions. Yeah, you really should have uh, taken a hint from the initial picture as well. Oh, does her necklace have anything new now that we know what it is? Uh, no. Not, nothing new. Okay, fair enough. Well, uh, I think it is probably time for us to rest. Yes, I think that seems sensible. So, we will head back to base. Or back into our bedroom, I guess, in this case. And we'll rest. Yes, let's go. You said you... Only forgot things that are not important. You only forget things that are not important. But sometimes the importance of some things is not apparent right away. Good point for Nenio. All right, what's Nenio gonna say? Perhaps I do not uh, forget. Uh, perhaps I do forget some important things from time to time, or perhaps I do not. I don't remember. Perfect. Perfect. Our party is full of absolute weirdos. I love it. Ria Neath. An old half-elf woman bows to you. She is stately despite her years, with grey strands in her carefully combed hair and a graceful figure. Rianeath, representative of Fur Dazzle & Co. Trading House in Nerosian, you're at your service. The woman hands you a business card printed on expensive paper with gold lettering. 
I have a formal, formal offer for the merchants of Dresden regarding their procurement of construction materials, and a more personal matter, which I'm afraid only you can help me with. What do you want to trade here? Um, did I ask the wrong question? Oh, do you want to trade here? Yes, for a while I have product samples of what our trading house has to offer. If you need something, you will easily find me in the fortress. But, to be honest, I can discuss supplies with your subordinates. What kind of personal matter? Rhea looks around. I would prefer not to talk about it here. Please, find me in the fortress, then we'll talk. Alright, I'll find you in half the time. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Hello, who are you? Hail, Commander. Captain Hermatton salutes. Permission to report. Although the desertion has been halted, not everyone appreciated your methods. A circle of discontents formed within the officers' ranks, calling themselves the wary. There, there are no blatant signs of sedition, otherwise they would have been arrested. Still, their talk is concerning. We can't rely on them. We need our own trusted officers. Ah, this is the military meeting. I suggest enlisting some of the volunteers. We get some very capable fighters among the fresh blood every day. The kind that could be made sergeant straight away. We'll need those who know the meaning of honor. We'll call paladins and knights from reputable, reputable orders. And they'll serve as an example to our soldiers, boosting everyone's morale too. Officers who are unworthy of their rank can always be replaced. We can identify experienced sergeants with reliable records of results, then promote them. I mean, that seems fair. Although, that might lead us to the Peter Principle. I, I hopefully I've got the right name. The Peter Principle is a principle in businesses where everybody will get promoted until the point of incompetence. As in, they were good at their job. You have somebody, they're a great manager, right? They, they're managing like a team of four people. They're absolutely great. They get great results. They're, you know, they're doing better than everybody um, at the same level of, as them. And you're like, right. We're going to promote this person. And then they, they start managing teams of these of managers, right? And they're okay. You know, they're, they're acceptable. And they're slightly above average. Then you promote them up to the next level. So they're, promote, they're managing teams of managers and managers. And then this person is just completely out of their depth. And they don't know what they're doing, right? And the Peter principle is they will stay at that level, right? Because they've got a track history of being generally good at the previous levels but they're a little bit incompetent at the level that they eventually reach. And the idea is that will work for every single level of the company, excluding, of course, entry level, right? Is that you will constantly get promoted until you are just incompetent enough not to be fired, but not to be promoted anymore. And that's roughly how it would work. So what I'm suggesting with Regil here is that you have a bunch of sergeants who are great at being sergeants. You might not want to promote them up because if you promote them up, they might not actually be very good at the next level that they're going to go to. It's just a thought. Anyway, uh, moving on. Mendev is full of promising youths who were overlooked when their seniors were promoted to serve in your army. We can call them here, award them rank, and they'll be grateful to us until the end of their days. Uh, why exactly are these wary unsatisfied? The words of Sila and the other faithful did their job, inspiring the formerly doubt-filled. However, the more cynical officers grumble that preaching doesn't fill empty stomachs. Can't judge them for refusing to fight for pretty words. Tisk tisk. But since they're bad-mouthing us, I will have to judge the scoundrels after all. Shame on them. So they were expecting bribes, the opportunists. And one more thing. I apologize if this sounds disrespectful, but these are the sentiments within the ranks. For the entire century, the Queen was the face of the Crusade. Even though she personally appointed you as commander, many still consider you an upstart unworthy of the high title. Many officers and soldiers dream of Her Majesty taking the lead. Okay, fair enough. Let's discuss our options in further detail. As you command. Alright, Captain Hamartin, what would you uh, advise? There are volunteers arriving every day with quite, uh, with some quite capable people in their midst. I wasn't a rookie when I joined the crusade, after all. I had a hundred years of military experience. We can rely on these new leaders to replenish our command staff. Should we entrust the lives of our soldiers to strangers? I'm not so sure. Alright, Sila, what's your plan? 
We need the most honorable, loyal so officers. Where else can we find them but among the chival chivalric orders and paladins? We'll invite valiant knights to Dresden and make them officers. They are the best hope for a crusader army. That sounds abs- that sounds fabulous, but there's just one tiny problem. Who do you think has been filling these positions until now? Did it truly not cross my dearest cru uh, cousin's mind to recruit your favorite paragons of honor and faith as your as officers? Your proposal is to repeat the exactly the same thing that's been going on without you for the last hundred years. Dare in your opinion, please. There are plenty of ambitious young men and women in Mendev waiting for the chance to prove themselves. They'll move mountains for whomever gives them this chance. The aspirations of hot-headed youth are the best fuel for war. Sure, why don't we invite some privileged youth as our officers? Gamblers, status seekers, fops, and brilliant poets unappreciated by the masses. That's what's been missing in our commanding ranks. I can see that the Count misses the high life dearly and would like to invite along the entirety of the captain's leisure class to join him in carousing. I can't stop him, so he can invite them to his heart's content, but not to serve here as officers. Rachel, what do you su uh, suggest? Appointing officers from the outside is a mistake. We should move our most distinguished privates up the ranks. The troops will be more eager to trust their former comrades and try to climb the ladders themselves. Of course, these officers will also prove more loyal than newcomers invited from who knows where. There's some truth to that. I became who I am by making it all the way from a thief to a paladin. But soldiers need not just generals, but mentors too. They need officers who embody honor and bravery, showing the true meaning of those virtues, as someone once showed me. Alright, everything is clear. So, any that we're going to just dump immediately. I think Darren is lowest. All generals gain one to level of Master of Maneuver feat. That's so good! Darren, why did you have to make such a horrible RP argument? This one is incredible. Master of Maneuver is, like, I think by far the best um, ability you can get. What this would allow us is this would allow, like, the army that we have, um, with the dwarf in charge of it to have, like, seven units at this point? That is absolutely incredible. And it would allow our alley battalion to be walking around with four units right now. Both of those are absolutely incredible. Okay, um, but RP-wise, it's by far the worst option. I think that they are correct in that inviting just random people who have no military experience to lead is probably not the best plan. What's the next lowest? I think Captain Hamartin is the next lowest. New officers from the ranks of the volunteers. Now I get where he's coming from, that they could turn out to be like him and have hundreds of years of experience and be very good fighters. My problem with it is that it doesn't actually... My problem is with it is that it's the strangers taking over aspect. It's the we're just getting these people in and just saying, hey, why don't you take charge? Why don't you take charge? Why don't you take charge? You know, it's not necessarily getting uh, people who are loyal to the crusade if they've only been here 10 minutes. What was his one? Heroic officer's feet. Plus five to combat morale. This just seems so much worse than Darren's op option as well. So now we have Sela and Regil. Both of them have positives and negatives. Um, Sela's... Darren made a good point in that that's what's been happening up until now. And Regil, we have the problem that perhaps... I actually kind of like Regil's promoting from below, despite my negative uh, thought about it before. I actually do kind of like the, the concept behind it, if done correctly. Let's see what the options are. Pious Officer's Feet. Infirmary size increased by 10%. Reg? Striving for Distinction. General has 10% bonus to gained experience points per level of this feat. Wow. Now, here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. Darren's, I think, is by far the best option. Like, I don't even think it is close what the best option is here. I think that Master of Maneuver is so good that 
it almost makes me want to just take it because it's so good. Like, I don't think anything else is even close to that. So, if we're assuming that we're not taking the best option, like, what's best out of infirmary size and striving for distinction? Infirmary size. Not even a question. It Like, I think that... 10% XP on your general is not worth... Like, I think that having the chance to take more losses in combat is worth a lot more than having 10% XP. Even though 10% XP could, in theory, give you Darren's thing eventually, but... I think this is the best option. Hopefully I won't regret not taking this one, but let's go with it. You won't regret this. I met a great many honorable warriors in my years of travel. It'll feel inspiring to fight beside them for a noble cause once again. I'll send them letters right away. I hope that these measures will solve the issue at hand. If we have further complications, I will call another council at once. Okay, well. There's what we got. Let's see what we've got in here. Um, I don't think that we actually spent a whole day yet. Yeah, we haven't spent a day, so we haven't got these two. Uh, but that's okay. Neither of them require us to be in Dresden, so that's fine. Uh, somebody wants us to go and speak to them, so we can try and find, uh, what's it, Rhea? Was that her name? Uh, we can go and try and find her and see what's going on. Hmm. Okay. Interesting stuff happening here. Right, let let's get moving. Off. I was half expecting my mirror to tell me off. It'd be like, you need to come and speak to me about this whole Camellia situation. But I'm assuming because they're a companion, it's not going to judge you as harshly. Because the game knows as well as I do that companions uh, get get a little bit of a free pass. Because, you know, you kind of need them for combat. Like, you need them for the gameplay aspect of the game. So, you know, you can't just be getting rid of all your companions. Let's move. Uh, anyway, where is this person? If they're back here, that would be annoying. Irabeth's out there actually right now. Um, just see if I can spot them in here. So that's Chief Sol, Lady Kenomi, Sierra, Horgus. Ah, Rianith is in here. Okay. Or outside there. Follow me. Oh, uh, while we're here. Hey, Blacksmith. Uh, bulk selling. Get rid of these. Get rid of the hand axes. Probably put, should have put some of this away, but that's okay. Uh, deal. Right. So, if we got anybody who can use the chain shirt of life, Vim. So, you're using just heavy arm. You're just actually use, just using a breastplate plus two right now. Okay. There's an argument that this one could be better, but I don't think it's really the right option for you. What's this one as well? Uh, plus four charisma. When you do a spell, uh, they take you gain temporary hit points. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I'm just, just seeing. You work off charisma, right? Yeah, so this is kind of meant for you, I think. Yeah. My other option is you could give it to Woolchiff, but he doesn't work off charisma is the problem. I think I give it to you. Yeah. Even though I don't think that the temporary hit points are that useful. It, maybe it works, but the plus four charisma is almost definitely useful, so we'll give that one to you. Right. This from this side. What armor are you using? Um. Okay, that's fine. We could. We need to find you better armor, but we need medium armor that has a high dex on it, which is not easily uh, obtainable. Um. You're currently using the padded armor of refined movement. You do have plus nine dex, to be fair. So I mean, that's you're fine. You're using Lady Calandria's uh, chain shirt, which again is um pretty high on dex. Yep, and it's mithril. Uh, you can't wear armor. You can't wear armor. You're wearing the adamantine chainmail. You know what? I think this might be slightly better than the adamantine chainmail. Although it does give... I suppose this one does give uh, damage reduction. So it's fine, I guess. Yeah, so this is for nobody right now. Uh, Amulet of natural armor we could give to somebody. Uh, I would think that Sela would be first in line for that. She already has one. Uh, we're probably next in line afterwards, although I think we already have something we're using. Uh, plus one say what? Well, uh, plus one uh, natural armor plus a plus four morale saving throw against poison. Uh, I don't think we need the saving throw against poison. I think I'd prefer just having higher armor. It probably means that we can give this one to you, just as somebody to have it. 
Anyone else missing a charm? You are. Okay. Just have a natural, another natural armor. It's fine. Okay, so this needs to go away. Cloak of Resistance needs to be sold. We'll sell that. Make 250. Cool. Right, we can put the chain shirt away later. Back down this way. I believe that she's standing outside the uh, the place, looking at it. Yeah, there we go. Right next to the one-eyed devil. Oh, she's also glowing. All right, I left. Um. Well, I'm gonna load the game again. Yeah, I'll load the game. That's fine. Uh, I didn't want to just end the conversation with her <laughs> immediately. Just be like, "See ya." I wanted to to quick save beforehand. Okay, we've only done conversations up to this point, so. And, and like a, little, a very tiny amount of um, like inventory management, so we don't need to worry too much about this. You know what? I can drop the thing off as well while we're here. Uh, let's go for Ember. Ember hat. Us. Am oh. Us amulet. Grey boar. Amulet. Cool. The rest of that can. Oh, uh, no. Wool Jiff amulet. There you go. Cool. Go with that. Let us be off. Then we can drop the chain shirt off here because we have no use of it. Okay. Uh, there we go. We'll drop that off for just now. We got better armor for um, like than just the breastplate plus two. By the way, I don't think so. No. I think that might actually still be his best armor. Just check it here. Chainmail of camaraderie actually would be better. Yeah, it would be better. Or Chainmail of the Dragonfly. Yeah, we've got a couple of different ones that Greyboar could be using instead of using this Breastplate plus two. Um, yeah, this one would be good. Uh, sorry, this one would be good. Yeah, this one's just straight up better. Then we compare them. Uh, let's see. I think this is. I think this is fine. Yeah, I think this. I, th I think what he's got on now is fine. So we now we can drop that one off as well. Uh, and those were all the chain mails he could wear, I think. Or all the ones that would give him an, an advantage. Oh, medium armor, that's what I was looking for. Uh, yeah, I think the rest of this is fine. Um, we should probably get rid of some of this, uh, but that's okay. We'll keep it for just now. Right. Leave there. Like the amulet of agile fist, actually, I probably should have just taken with me and got rid of. Because I think we even have better versions of it. Right. Walk down, sell our stuff, and then we'll spot we'll walk to Rhea and speak to her. Except we're quick say before speaking to her, because I want to Let's accuse move. her of, you know, her misdeeds. But anyway, we'll do that after some more stuff. Speediest retreat. Best spell for taking for running around Dresden. Hello. Bulk sell. Sell, 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 sell. Cool. Right. Leave him be. Go through this way. And all the way along here. Right. Quick save. Hello. <laughs> Rhea is standing, arms folded, pensively observing the activity around her. Noticing you, she greets you with a nod. Remind me, who are you? Rini, sales uh, representative of Viridazzle and Co. Trading House in Nerosian. I have a few offers for your quartermaster, but making business connections is not my main reason for being here. What's this personal matter you wish to discuss with me? Rhea sighs loudly. She obviously has trouble saying this. Her cold, business-like manner melts away. I, oh, oh, well, I've said this in my head so many times, and now I actually have to say it. I can't put two words together. I, I, I want you to talk to my son very much, but he's, I want to talk to my son very much, but he is avoiding me. I know you're a friend, so at least he listens to you. If only you could convince him, or at least uh, approach, to at least approach me. Um, uh, just a minute. What's your son's name? I know no one of the name, I know no one by the name of Neith. Of course, forgive me. Neith is not my real family name, exactly. My husband doesn't have any at all. Neither did I. We took the name of the village he lived in. My son's name is Lan. Oh, ho, ho. He knows that I'm here, and he is hiding from me. I can't blame him, but I I might never have an, another chance to make amends. And I want to 
tell him I love him. Why doesn't Lan want to see you? Rhea turns around. Isn't it obvious? I gave up and abandoned him. The day my father and I, the day his father and I decided to go our separate ways. That was it. He must resent me or hate me. Maybe he's ashamed of me. Or maybe he's wiser than me. S some children shouldn't meet their mothers. There's no point in reopening old wounds. But I still want to see him. So much. A half-elf married a mongrel. How did that happen? Rhea smiles, sadly. When it comes to love, does it matter who you are? Back when I was young, I was a smuggler. One day, my friends and I were attacked by our rivals. They were in such a hurry to get their plunder, they didn't even finish us off. They just threw us into a well, headed up in the mongrel tunnels. Kin was young and curious. Luckily, our boots interested him less than we did. He brought me back to life. I screamed and stabbed him. That was probably a sign that our marriage wouldn't be a happy one. And still, we loved each other. Um, he took care of me and was always able to make me l laugh. He was optimistic, but not the most driven man. I, on the contrary, was too driven. I dragged him to the surface. I believe back then I could move mountains if I just wanted it hard enough, but it didn't work out. Alright, why did you abandon your son? Because, Rhea fights back tears, as if the tragedy is still too raw for her. I broke up. Uh, sorry, I broke. Gave up. Convinced myself that it was our decision, not my decision. That it would be better for everyone. I'm not sure if Lan told you, but I had other children besides him. They were different. All of them were special, and all were missing something. They just couldn't survive. The last one was born in pieces, and I realized he would be the last one. I just knew it. I didn't need any healers to tell me that. After that, it's like I sank into a black hole. I saw Kin grieve. I saw Lan struggle to find a place for himself. The neighbors felt no pity for us when they heard about our struggles. They accused us of worshipping demons. Lamash to anyone. And I realized, I realized I was to blame for all of it. For making Kin go up to the surface. For deciding to have children with him. No matter what. For appearing in Kin's life, having Lan, and for what? So he could suffer? Kin and I discussed it. He said he would take our son and go to his tribe. We both thought we were relieving each other of a terrible burden. That at last we'd be making Lan happy, because he would grow up among his own kind. I still ask myself if we did the right thing. If Lan doesn't want to see me, there was, um, there was nothing right. If Lan doesn't want to see me, there was nothing right about it. What kind of mother could abandon her own child? Rhea looks you in the eyes. Yes, I agree. Alright, I'll find your son. Rhea nods, trying to maintain her composure, but tears are glistening in her eyes. Thank you, this means so much to me. I wanted to ask something else. It might be rude, but I'm worried about Lan, so is he just one of your fighters, nothing more? Forgive me for being tactless, but people say he is um, often seen with you. I haven't figured that out yet. I see, forgive me. I suppose it's too late now for me to be worrying about his happiness after so many years, but I couldn't help but ask. Alright, show me your wares. Fur Dazzle and Co. Trading House provides only the best. Alright, what do you have? No weapons, no armor, ring of protection and natural uh, amulets. Okay, nothing here I need. Okay, so you provide like nothing. Fair enough. Cool, I just wanted to check if I could go back in the conversation. You, I know you've broken the law, it's time to admit your misdeeds. Rhea folds her arms across her chest. Yes, I've broken the law, but not now and not in Dresden. When I was young, I smuggled, I stole, I lied, but those days are long gone. Kin, my husband, showed me the value of an honest life. I excused all my wrongdoings as just me being poor and having no choice. Kin and his tribe had nothing, but they never used that as an excuse to commit crimes. I decided to live like Kin and never have straight. I decided to live like Kin and have never strayed from that path. I give to temples and the poor. I share like the Mongols shared with me. If this and all my hardships haven't atoned for my sins, then I guess nothing ever will. Alright, so we could just kick her out, but we don't necessarily need to do that. Also, criminals are not welcome in Dresden is probably very, very Follow hypocritical me. given our current situation. <laughs> uh, with Camellia. Anyway. Down here. Hello, Lan. Uh, congratulations, Chief. How do you like your new title? Lan looks at you sullenly. If I just scream, ah, for five minutes and rip out all the hair out of my, and rip all the hair out of my body, will that count as an answer to your question? I've always been a loner, mu as much as anyone can be in a tribe. Sure, I was never left out of any birthday parties, but only out of courtesy. 
I got used to caring only about myself. Now the entire tribe is my responsibility, and I'm expected to feed them, teach them, heal them, settle their disputes. Sometimes I feel like I'm going insane, and I can't do anything right, and sometimes I take a breath, look around, and everything seems to be working. No one's died, no one's crying or eating dirt, which means I've done alright. But look who I'm talking to. You understand it just as well as I do. What's it like being commander? Um, well... I never thought I'd reach such heights, but I like it. Are you suggesting I should try and enjoy my new position? I may struggle with that. Maybe I should get a servant to follow me around, fanning me whenever I want. Alright, well, uh, on another news line, your mother came to see me. Uh, why don't you want to talk to her? Ah, she got to you too. He clears his throat. But, that's, but it's not that I don't want to see her. I'm just busy. Lan waves his hand vaguely. With, you know, this and that, crusade matters. Sometimes I feel like a mother of a large brood. And besides, she didn't uh, come here for me. She's here on business. I don't want to distract her. By the way, have you seen her card? I got one from a merchant. Lan produces a business card from his pocket. Rhea Neath, Fear Dazzling Co. Trading House, Neurosian, Boston Gold and everything. People with gold lettering on their business cards probably don't even have time for idle chit-chat. I'll bet you I need to book an appointment a week in advance. Even if I do, what would we talk about? Do you think I'm angry at her? I'm not. I never was. She and my dad had it rough. They didn't make it, and that's nobody's fault. But so much time has passed. She and I are just strangers now. If you happen to see her, tell her I've got a lot on my plate right now. Maybe some other time. I know she lives in Nerosian now. Maybe I'll send her a present on her birthday. Okay. Well, uh, see ya. We never actually looked at her card, to be fair. Let's have a look. Rhea Neath, sales representative. Fur Dazzle Co. Trading House. Coronation Avenue, Nerosian. Okay, well, now I'll go and speak to his mother. I mean, they're maybe, what, ten minutes from each other? They could just walk over, but... I guess I'm gonna just be between be between them here. Right. Hello. I'm sorry, but Lan doesn't want to see you. We couldn't phrase that in any other way. Rhea nods. He is stubborn. I'm not sure if he gets it from me or his father. Please try again, but now. Rhea retrieves a package from her bag and opens it to reveal a small striped arrow painted in yellow and red, but with blue fetching. There. It's an arrow from his very first bow. I made them so bright so they could easily be seen in the grass. I showed him how to shoot. I taught him how to train his vision, to account for the wind, to fix his string. Just take it to him as a souvenir, a keepsake. Tell him I've never forgotten him. I know Lan won't forgive me, but he should know that at least. Alright, well, I will take it back to Lan. Um, a toy arrow with bright red and yellow stripes and blue... Uh, is that fletching? Fletching, yeah. Okay. Onwards. Head back. We will then speak to Lan again. And no doubt have to pass a uh, check in order to make him speak to his mother. Let's see. Hello, Lan. Your mom gave this to me. She's never forgotten you. She is very sorry. Lan takes the arrow carefully and examines it. This is my toy from when I was a kid. It's suddenly he breaks the arrow with his clawed hand and flings it behind his back. Ah, it doesn't matter. Not anymore. She made her choice. My dad let her. I don't want to blame her. I have no right to. Lan catches his breath and smiles with the human half of his mouth. Sorry, I must have woken up on the wrong side of the bed today. Sitting around Dresden for too long is bad for me. I start getting irritated by the smallest things. I'm always in the best mood when I'm killing demons in the wounds. Don't tell her I threw away, uh, threw away the arrow. And please tell her I don't want to see her. It'd be better for everyone that way. Okay, I'll go back and speak to your mother. <laughs> I really hope at some point I'm able to just say, look, can you just walk over there and speak to Lan? They just turn up. It would just be easier for me. Let's move. Oh. Um, he threw the arrow away. I'm sorry. Uh, he told me not to tell her that, but okay. Rhea grits her teeth, holding back tears and tosses her head proudly. All right, all right. It was just a silly sentimental piece of wood that won't change anything. He is right. He did the right thing. Oh, there he is. Hello. Lan strides up to Rhea and stops as if he's hit an invisible wall. Mom, you look well. Rhea clenches her fingers so tight her knuckles go white. Lan, you're so tall. 
I see your entri entire tribe is here. How was Dad? Did he stay down below? He died. Oh, I see. Lan, I thought you didn't want to come. Lan sighs heavily. I still don't want to be here, but I'd be a coward if I didn't come. It's alright, Mom. I'm not angry with you. I've just been very busy. Rhea looks away. You're lying. Am I not even worthy of your anger, Lan? Do you hate me that much? Is that all you have to say to each other? Why don't you finally reconcile? Because we never fought. I don't understand why this is such a big deal. Alright, we said hello. I've done my filial duty. Do you hate me, Lan? Mom, of course not. Lan frowns and shakes his head. I understand. For years I've blamed myself for you and Dad trying to live like a normal family and have more children. If I hadn't given you false hope by being born alive and almost human, grief wouldn't have broken you. If anyone is to blame, it's me. I don't have the right to be angry with you. Um... What does it matter if you have the right or not? Say what you really feel. Lan sighs, gathering his thoughts and turns to you. I can't joke my way through this, can I? Do you want me to turn to my mother and say, Mom, it doesn't matter that my last brother was taken out of you piece by piece. It doesn't matter that you've been banished from everywhere because of Dad and me. None of that matters because a selfish brat wanted to have a mom. It still does, even after growing up into a man. Is that what you want me to say? No, that'll never happen. Never. Rhea smiles sadly. You've already said everything you need to, sweetie. And you've never been a selfish brat. Headstrong and a little lazy, maybe. But never selfish. Forgive me. I love you so much, whether you believe it or not. I'm sorry that I wasn't strong enough to be the mother you deserve. Lan gives up. His face falls like someone let all the air out of him. I forgive you. I love you too. What I said just now I went too far. I was so lonely without you. I'm angry at you and Dad. And, and, mo and myself most of all. I know, Lan. I'm so sorry. Bia quickly wipes away her tears and smiles. You silly little cave potato, don't you dare be angry at yourself. I've never regretted having you. Not a single day, you know? I'm leaving soon, but when the war is over, find me in Nerosian. We'll visit your brothers together. I made sure their graves were looked after. Well, do you agree? Lan gulps and nods without saying a word. Hey! Oh, and then they go for a hug. Look at that. It's nice and wholesome. And we're going to watch the whole time. Because that's not creepy. <laughs> I love how he went into his idol animation. I I'd like you to stay longer. Look, I can do all this monk stuff now. What do they say about you in the legends? Lan, who went to the crusade with his mommy. <laughs> okay, we got more here. Warriors of Dresden. Would you get a load of this? My own mother is humiliating me. Perfect. Anything else? And of course, uh, and of course you didn't hear me say legend. Are we done? I think we're done. Yes. I think I have the best son, if not in the entire world, then definitely in Dresden. Oh, we got more here. You've grown so big. Not a little potato, I remember. How come no one has snatched you up and married you yet? Alright, Lan, let's see your response. Mom, did you know that grown men whose mothers call them little potatoes in the middle of Dresden don't tend to have much luck with the ladies? <laughs> We're just going to stand right here and watch, just as awkwardly as possible. This guy's doing it too. Oh, sorry, dear. Will big potato work? Th this citizen is also like, I want to hear more of this. Do I need more, like, voice lines for, or, like, you know, dialogue for me? Or are we done here? Oh, he's back into his idol pose. I think we might be done here. Let's try and trigger something else. No, I think we are done. I think we're done. Just waiting for that to disappear. Yes, okay, cool. Well... With all of that, I think it is time for us to end the episode there. Thank you for watching. Next time, um, well, I'm not sure what we're doing. We're leaving Dresden and going somewhere, but the somewhere, I'm a little uncertain of. So thank you for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.